quite a bit while I've been here, so it's been a very good time in this respect. I'm going to be talking today about some work on finding some minimal approaches, as in minimal resource approaches, to quantum communication and hopefully also quantum computation. And I'm now at MIT. I should mention that a little bit of the work I'm going to talk about was done when I was actually uh, finishing up at, at Harvard. And uh, it is in collaboration with a number of people there and along with a little bit at MIT. The sort of motivation here is to come up with some way of taking our knowledge of fault-tolerant architectures, which is quite uh, developed, I might say, and connecting it to the range of experimental results. In my vision here, I have this Venn diagram of what we know about fault-tolerant architectures, what we can do in current experiment, and roughly where they overlap. Actually, when I first made this slide, there was no overlap. Um, but after Panos's talk, I decided that perhaps I would allow for a small overlap right here. So the hope is, indeed, that we can really use the knowledge and developments in current experiment to implement the ideas in fault-tolerant architectures. However, the assumptions amongst usual fault tolerance proposals are mostly incompatible with what you do in experiment. And it's the standard problem that, of course, in principle, fault tolerant thresholds are reachable. But in practice, the experiments indicate that we have a very difficult system level problem. And so the premise of this talk is that there's going to exist some type of almost evolutionary path in which we can take the approaches that are occurring in current experiment and get all the way to a fault-tolerant architecture. Of course, if you think about most experimentalists, they assume that this path exists. They're not looking for a huge revolution. They're looking for a series of steps that they can take to take their device and turn it into computer. I should mention, of course, that along the, all along the way of this evolutionary path, there's a few things that we hope to accomplish that might be less than computation, but still extremely interesting. And uh, uh, just some highlights here. One is long distance entanglement. So showing that we can actually loophole free violate Bell's inequality, showing that entanglement is meaningful at macroscopic distances or distances the size of the Earth. Perhaps producing very interesting macroscopic quantum states or new quantum phases of matter. These are sort of the physics side of things that I think would be very exciting. And of course, if we can really bridge the gap from current experiment to fault tolerant architectures, these things will come along for the ride. To give you an example picture of what's happening on the experimental side, I have two systems which are near and dear to my heart. I don't mean to insult anyone by only focusing on these two. They're just two that I know quite well. These are some current small scale devices. The scale here refers to the number of qubits involved. They have some nice properties already. They have good quantum memory. They have good local operations. And perhaps not so nice a property, it's very hard to scale the actual systems in use to many qubits. So one system is the so-called linear Paul trap systems. And I have a few pictures here of Paul trap systems. So this is not a linear one. But Paul trap systems throughout the world where people are trying to couple them efficiently to photons. So there's cavities here along with this Paul trap. And these are, of course, ion trapping systems where I can't scale the size very much because I have only a single trapping zone. But on the other hand, the technology is extremely mature. And so it's very easy to do this good local operation and to demonstrate extremely good quantum memories. Another system that is sort of near to my heart is these nitrogen vacancy centers in diamond. This is a color center embedded in a diamond crystal. It has extremely good coherence properties. In fact, we've possibly been able to demonstrate now memory times for nuclear spins in this type of system that are exceeding hundreds of, of milliseconds. So both of these systems have nice properties when it comes to sort of quantum memory and local control, but they also have the problem that it's very difficult to see how to scale it to many qubits. Now, in the Paul trap systems, there's these multi-zone trap approaches, which I think are very promising. But I'm going to focus on what's actually been done in experiment in these linear Paul systems. And the idea here is really that I'm going to focus now on some immediate application, which is quantum communication, and then as time allows, 
talk about some longer term applications in computation. So the focus of this talk is twofold. First, on quantum communication, optimizing quantum communication under the assumption that the current round of experiments are already quite useful. And how do we take advantage of this, these few qubits that we've been able to develop? I will then go on to talk about a minimal resource approach to distributed computation in which we develop fixed size registers, which are some type of commodity good. And then we change the systems level problem to a register problem plus a connection problem. So focusing first, however, on this optimizing quantum communication, I should mention, of course, the simplest ideas behind communication. There hasn't been much discussion of this sort of specialized type of error correction, which is quantum communication. So the very simplest thing is the statement that with photons, linear optics are going to be an extremely useful way to measure Bell states and to create Bell states. And what you use is the indistinguishability of photons. So imagine for the moment that I have a photon coming in on some path and a beam splitter here, a 50-50 beam splitter. The point is that the photon coming from the left hits the beam splitter and it splits off going left and right with equal probability. The unitary transform associated with that takes the photon annihilation operators and changes them to these rotated superpositions. We can do this in the laboratory with extremely high fidelity. These linear optics devices are very well done. But what's interesting about this is that the case in which I start with single photon states, the so-called Fox states, this procedure actually maps me to an entangled state. It's a sort of left-right entanglement, if you will. You can imagine I have a photon on the left incoming channel, and it goes to a superposition now of left and right, which we recognize as some type of entangled state of the photon with the vacuum. Now, this is a very poor entangled state. For example, I challenge you to come up with a unitary rotation which you can implement in the laboratory, which rotates you from zero photons to one photon. But nonetheless, it is a useful uh, thing to note because it means that if I were to measure a click, that is the existence of a photon at one of these detectors, it would project some other system via a Bell state measurement. And you can sort of see what's happening is the left photon gets split, the right photon gets split, and I've lost the so-called which path information in the process, which means that I, in principle, can entangle some bit of information connected with these photons. More specifically, the standard idea is to use photons to build entanglement and to have some type of quantum memory attached to those photons so that we can use the results efficiently. The simplest example for this type of system is some atom or ion or other emitter with two metastable states, which I've labeled here as 0 and 1. You can think of these as the qubit states. And an excited state, where the excited state has the property that under the particular choice of laser excitation, polarization, and frequency, zero is excited, but one is not. And thus, with a laser pi pulse, I can create population from zero, move it to the excited state, and then it will decay with the emission of a photon. That photon can head to beam splitter path, so I'll put an emitter here, I'll put an emitter here, and I'll, this is, of course, only one scheme. There's many schemes for doing this. This is one that's particularly easy to understand, so I like it. The idea is I'll start with the superposition of these two metastable states, the so-called qubit states, where there's a relatively high probability that I'm in this dark state here, and a relatively low probability that I'm in the state zero, which can be excited. And similarly, I prepare the other emitter in the same state. And now the point is, when I apply the laser excitation, photons are emitted, they go to the beam splitter, and they go left-right, the beam splitter destroys the which-way information, and this is making it now a partial Bell measurement on the photon number space. So if you think what's happening to this state, well, if I was in the state 1-1, one, one, no, no photons are emitted because it's completely dark, and so that state doesn't allow for a click event to occur. If I'm in the state 0-1 or 1-0, then I have a photon left-right entanglement initially, or left-right state initially, which when it goes through the beam splitter becomes a partial Bell state, which under measurement projects me into a Bell state of the two emitters. There is, of course, a correction term of order p, which is occurring now with probability little p squared, due to the fact that two photons could have been emitted. And because photons are so ephemeral, there's a very high probability that those two photons that were emitted result in only a single click on the detectors on the other end, because one photon gets lost. So that's going to be an error term which I'd like to make small. I will note, however, that this procedure, when it succeeds, 
is almost completely purified against photon loss. So it's a very simple example of a purification protocol against a very peculiar noise channel, the noise channel of loss. Some of the requirements here, of course, that I use weak excitation, I want to reduce all two photon events. I'm relying on this sort of single click, which is destroying the which path information. In order to do that, these photons really must be indistinguishable. In practice, that means I need interferometrically stable configurations, and that's quite a challenge experimentally. You can imagine, for example, that creating an interferometer of 10 kilometers where the spacing is, has to be stabilized to within 10 nanometers is going to be a challenge for any experimentalist. And there are some approaches to alleviate this challenge, which I'm not going to discuss. But what I am going to talk about is the implicit assumption here. And the implicit assumption for doing quantum tasks that are anything more interesting than just generating entanglement is that I need a good quantum memory. And you see in particular that this procedure, when it fails, when I get no click, is destructive. I need to completely reset the emitter states before I can continue. And that means if I want to do some type of teleportation-based gate, for example, I need to keep around a quantum memory as well. I should also mention that the first experiment really demonstrating this with ions has been done recently in Chris Monroe's group, and you can read about it in Nature. It's quite a beautiful experiment. Uh, I should mention also, of course, that this proof of principle experiment has an extremely low success rate. The rates were less than one per second, but it could be improved by about four orders of magnitude, I think, with their current experimental setup. So this thing can really start to, you can really start to think about generating entangled pairs at some finite distance with reasonable bit rates now. And this is really the task of quantum communication. But in quantum communication, we should also have, of course, a problem. And this is photon loss problem. As the distance between the emitters gets larger and larger, the probability that the photon travels down the whole path and gets to the beam splitter is exponentially decreasing. This is due to attenuation in optical fibers, for example. And thus, this communication task can succeed, but it doesn't scale well. It's an exponential with the distance. The solution to this problem was suggested by Briegel and Dewar and Stark and Solar, along with, of course, the Oxford group and Charlie Bennett. And the idea is to create a so-called quantum repeater. Classically, if I lose the photon, it's not too much of a problem. I use many photons, and I amplify. But we know quantum mechanically we cannot amplify without also introducing noise. And so we have to do something a bit different than amplification. The repeater is the solution to that problem. So imagine for the moment that these red things are just some quantum bits that I can produce entanglement between. The entanglement is labeled here with this little black line. And I'm going to assume as a resource that I can create with some high probability and decent fidelity these short range entangled pairs of this form. And that in addition, I have a few qubits available to me at each repeater node, at each sort of physical station, in which I can do relatively good local operations, in which I also have a good quantum memory. And then you come up with the structure, as Wolfgang Dewar did, where the vertical axis here represents qubits in a physical location, a so-called node, and sometimes they're bunched this way so that uh, you can sort of see the left-right usage of these qubits. This node has three, this has two, this has four. The idea is that these nodes are actually some type of commodity level device for quantum communication. That if I accidentally destroyed this guy over here, I'd just take another one off the shelf and put it in the place of that node. I should also mention that the assumed distances here are about the attenuation length of optical fiber, so say 10 to 20 kilometers between each of these nodes. Now the repeater protocol to take the short distance entanglement and make a long distance entanglement is one of divide and conquer. So in particular, I start with entanglement at the short distance here and try and generate entanglement at this short distance as well. And now we know if I make a Bell measurement of this pair here, which is a reasonable local operation, it will project the system into a Bell pair of the other side. And this then doubles the length of the entanglement. However, this procedure fails with some probability, and even when it succeeds, it may reduce the fidelity of the state because it occurs, it has some errors associated with it. And thus, I need to add to this entanglement connection some type of purification procedure to improve the fidelity so that I can keep the fidelity overall nearly constant as a function of the distance. I should also mention that this procedure takes a characteristic time, which is given by twice the local generation time, divided by the probability that the overall procedure succeeds. 
So how do I do purification? Well, I'm going to take one of these pairs that I just created, I store it now in a memory. And now I create a second pair. Now I can do a local operation. I have two entangled pairs of finite fidelity. As long as they're above 0.5, in principle, I can purify them with local operations to create a higher fidelity pair here. I repeat this procedure many times, and I get some limiting fidelity pair, which I call here an A pair. This pair is now twice the distance of the original entangled pair, and presumably of similar or higher fidelity. The overall time to generate this A pair now is given by the time to generate B pairs times 2 divided by roughly the probability that my uh, overall purification protocol has succeeded. And then finally, I can generate an A pair here, an A pair here, do the connection procedure, and of course, I repeat. And this divide and conquer procedure now has a nice property that the time to generate the next level of the tree here, which is a logarithmic in the distance, is proportional to the time to generate the previous level of the tree times some constants. And in particular, you'll note that it's proportional to the time to generate the shortest distance pair times some number to log of the distance. Little n is log of the distance, and so it's overall polynomial in the distance. Thus, I've taken an exponential problem and turned it into a polynomial problem. But you see that I assumed here logarithmic in the distance resources in a given node, and that's inconsistent with my initial statement that it wanted a procedure in which the number of qubits was going to be fixed. But it turns out, not all is lost, that you can do a minimal resource version of this where I somehow get around this purification problem of which, re, which was really requiring log d qubits per node by delocalizing purification. And it turns out it's going to be just sufficient to do two qubits. The idea is, that, okay, the red qubits here are these emitters, the gray qubits are the memory, and the idea is that I'm going to just use entanglement between nearest neighbors in this chain as a way to mediate quantum gates. So my before local operations now become non-local operations, but just at a distance of one repeater node away. And this is going to be now trading qubits per node for time scaling. The local operations that I assumed before were going to be substantially faster and have higher fidelity, whereas these non-local gates I'm going to pre perform now are going to be somewhat lower fidelity, and so I have a time overhead that I generate here. It also uh, so anyway, the point is that I create some entanglement, for example, between memories here and here, and here and here, and now the equivalent to the connection procedure I did before is to create an entangled pair at the shortest distance, and now do a pair of local Bell measurements, and that indeed projects me into a long distance but lower fidelity entangled pair. So this entanglement connection is basically the same as what you saw before, but rather than having these two qubits at the same node, they're now separated by one unit of distance. You can see already that this separation choice may not be optimal, and in fact, there may be a, an, a variety of different scenarios for doing this, and so what I'm about to talk about in a moment is a dynamic programming optimization of this type of protocol, but I should just finish the protocol first, I suppose. This was to create a long distance but lower fidelity pair. How do I purify it? Well, I create slightly shorter distance pairs, and now connect these pairs, and I have a pair which is almost the same distance and almost the same fidelity, but it's shorter by a distance of two units. Now I create entanglement just between nearest neighbors here and here, and I mediate some gate between these, which will purify this A pair and repeat many times. Again, the scaling of this whole procedure is polynomial in the distance. The benefit is really that a two qubit device is going to suffice. So if I have an ion trap, which I can do very high fidelity operations with two qubits, and to which I can get photons in and out, which is generally a reasonable assumption, then I can actually do quantum communication, and I can even do purification. Can we optimize this procedure, however? And the answer is yes. The idea is the following. We have to first, of course, define the optimization problem. Well, what do we want to achieve? In quantum communication, we usually have two things. One is that we have some distance that we want to go. For example, I want to communicate with someone uh, at a bank across the ocean. I have a particular distance I'm going to have to travel. But I also want to achieve some minimum fidelity, F. If my fidelity is too low, then if I want to use this channel for quantum communication, uh, in the sense of 
cryptography, I need it to be a certain, above a certain point. If I want to use it for teleportation-based gates, it has to be above a certain point. And so I have a target fidelity and also a target distance. And then I say, well, how do I minimize the time for pair generation? That's going to maximize the bandwidth of entangled pairs in my procedure. And I have available to me this entanglement generation procedures, these purification procedures. But the challenge is that I really have an exponential space of suboptimal solutions to the problem. Because I can choose to entangle or arbitrary pairs at increasing distances. I can choose to connect arbitrary pairs at increasing distances. And you have a variety of choices between the distances, between the initial and intermediate fidelities, what purification stages you use, the number of steps of purification, where you choose to split pairs when the distance is not exactly halvable. And the beauty of this type of exponential space of suboptimal solutions is that uh, it's something that you think maybe I don't have to solve, but maybe a computer can solve. In fact, we can even restrict the space to less than this. But I should, this is sort of just diagrammatic of what's going on. The point is, I can use different fidelity pairs to connect these things. And I'd like to be able to understand how the different procedures for purification can be optimized. So the dynamic programming approach to this problem is the following. I'm going to break this problem into sub-problems. So I satisfy, I find the optimal solution for a distance roughly half. And I make a table of these optimal solutions for distance half cases. And then inside of this, I'm going to have a variety of things I can vary. But once I've created the table for distance half, I then, when I look for the distance, regular distance solutions, just draw from pairs that I created in the distance half solutions. And I look for different combinations to produce the desired fidelity at the distance. So this is doing a recursive optimization procedure in which I go all the way down, or inductive if you will, I go all the way down to distance one solutions. And I use those to build up distance two solutions, which are then used to build up distance three and four, and then seven, uh, five, six, seven, eight, et cetera, et cetera. And I just store these tables. This procedure is known in computer science as dynamic programming because it corresponds uh, to a series of nested solutions in which solving subproblems gives me near optimal solutions for the original problem. As an example, here's a case for distance 11 using this two qubits per node repeater protocol. It's a bit complicated. This is the original protocol. The idea is that I have A pairs, which are the short distance pairs. I use A pairs to create B pairs, which are slightly longer, and C pairs, which purify, to create, again, another A pair. And that A pair joins that A pair to create a B pair, which joins with a C pair to create another A pair, which joins to create a B pair to create also a C pair to create another A pair. So there's a variety of, you can see that this part comes from the C and the B, and the, the C and the B each come from a C and a B of a shorter distance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can compare this, of course, to the computer-optimized version of the same problem, and you see that there's a few differences. So for example, here the C pair was created from B pairs, which was in turn created from A pairs of half length, and here I actually do two steps of going smaller before I start to do the connection. And so I use this sort of left-right nodes, but not center nodes, for an extra step to get a little extra fidelity out of it and a little extra bandwidth. More generally speaking, okay, so I'm finding now approximately optimal solutions for a given distance, but the computer has also allowed me to find some sort of non-obvious improvements to this type of problem. One is this so-called node skipping, in which I don't actually bother in creating pairs of slightly shorter length, and, or of length over two, and joining them. But I start by creating pairs of just slightly shorter length, which in turn purified by pairs of slightly shorter length again. So I can remove connection steps. And by doing that, I can actually improve the bandwidth. Another is this so-called multi-level pumping, in which I pre-purify shorter distance pairs before using them in the algorithm. These lead to some general improvements in the overall bandwidth of procedures. So for this sort of original protocol that I presented before with logarithmic number of qubits per node, I have an uh, improvement of about a factor of uh, 3 to 10 in terms of the time generation per qubit. So this is the time to generate the given entangled pair 
in the old procedure and in the optimized procedure. What I get, however, in the case of this two qubit per node protocol is a factor almost of 100 improvement in bandwidth. I should note that the distances I'm assuming here is about uh, 1,200 kilometers. The pair fidelity I'm aiming for is about 97%. And the time here is still 100 seconds for one entangled pair. So it's not that good. But it's under optimization substantially better. I'm going to change uh, topics in a moment, but before I do, I just want to mention that this type of dynamic programming, programming procedure should also work in principle for quantum error correcting codes, particularly if you use concatenation. The idea, again, is that if I can find suboptimal or optimal solutions for the subproblems, I can use those optimal solutions for solving the next step of the procedure. And so if I want to ask the question, what is an optimal set of quantum codes to use in error correction? Dynamic programming might be a very useful tool for solving that particular problem. I'm now going to, however, change gears a bit and ask, are these commodity devices I've been talking about good for something beyond communication? Of course, the answer is yes. But the motivation goes back to talks that you heard by David Corey and also by one of my collaborators, Rod Van Meter in which we're starting to look at the systems level problem of computation. So one is, of course, that I have an apparatus for many qubits. At some point, I'm going to run into a quantum control problem because I either have limited space because of cooling efficiency, because of control electronics, or perhaps because I have a limited set of frequency space that I can use for a given physical device. As my sort of favorite example of the difficulty of the control problem, I I'd like to show this particular image from this paper by Levin van der Sippen and uh, Chuang Trup at the time, in which they were doing experimental realization of the factoring algorithm on seven qubits. This is the pulse sequence that they used to do it. And about 90% of the pulses that you see here applied to these seven qubits have nothing to do with the algorithm. They're all refocusing pulses. They're all control pulses. And this gives you a sense of the problem of Getting past this control problem as I keep increasing the number of bits is going to be quite hard. So our solution is instead to fix this number of bits that I have to solve the control problem for and then have a very different system for connecting these bits to create a computer. The general approach is to build what we like to call a quantum register. We're going to use the quantum communication techniques I just described between registers to create some type of non-local operations where we're taking a noisy and failure-prone channel using local operations in the register to improve it to the point where we might be able to achieve fault tolerance. I should mention that this idea of having sort of memory and a teleportation, teleportation unit isn't very new. And you know, at the level of sort of architectures, it was thought of maybe already five years ago. A fundamental point here is how I'm going to take this non-deterministic somewhat low fidelity uh, pair entanglement generation procedure and turn it into a deterministic algorithm type uh, operation. So for imagine for the moment I want to do some type of desired logical circuit between qubits, like a C naught followed by a second C naught. The procedure is actually quite straightforward. I break this up into pairwise gates or gates that commute with each other is also, also going to be sufficient. And I'm going to set a clock cycle time. Now this is something I can optimize. Within that cycle, I can have two different things. I can either have, its, well, three actually. I can have success, of course. I can have a logical error occurring because I have errors in my pulses and the like. And I can also have now a new type of error, which is a just a did not succeed error. It's a statement that within my allotted time, I didn't get to do the operation I wanted to do, and I know about it. So I'm dividing this up into pairwise operations. And then let me look at just these two qubits. If I want to do the C naught, so I have these memory qubits, which are the actual qubits, if you will, and then these ancillary qubits, the ancillary qubits of the optical type, which can be connected using these entanglement generation procedures. And so I just attempt to create entanglement a number of times within one cycle. If I'm lucky, I succeed, and then I do a teleportation-based gate using this entanglement that I've created. The whole thing has to fit within my cycle time, T sub C, and if I don't succeed, then I get one of these did not succeed errors, which I can now tell my operating system, hey, I didn't succeed in that operation. You're going to need to correct that. The 
there's an overhead I incur here. One is, of course, that the time per gate has increased from just the generation time here to many generation attempts and also these local operations. So I have a big overhead in time. The other statement is that when I'm, once I'm successful, I have many more actual operations used to create a single logical operation. And so there's an overhead, some effective number of gates times local error rates for this non-local gate. And now we have, have to ask the question, what is going to be the minimal register with those ideas in mind? So I'm certainly going to need this optical qubit. I need something to do entanglement generation. I should mention while I'm at it, if I have the optical qubit in the first place, I can do something very nice. I can also use it, of course, for measurement and initialization. I made a big effort to be able to collect photons from that one qubit. I can use those photons not only for entanglement generation, but also for measurement. I also need, of course, this memory qubit. Because once I'm trying to generate this entanglement, I have to be able to sit and wait while the entanglement is being generated. And so I'm going to need actually quite good quantum memory. I'm also going to need good local control because, again, I'm making a trade-off between this low fidelity non-local interaction and the high fidelity internal interaction. Of course, I finally need some type of reasonable optical interface. And the example, actually, that that is Ladd gave a nice talk yesterday showing the recent progress in photonics. And the idea is you have some system with optical switches and photodetectors and beam splitters and maybe some large interferometry system in here. However, in contrast to what Thad was talking about yesterday, we're not too afraid of photon loss in these types of systems because we can purify against photon loss. And that's mostly because you have this memory qubit in addition to the optical qubit. The picture is something like this. I have this optical thing which I can address with the laser and that single photons can be emitted. And then I have these auxiliary qubits nearby which are my controlled microwave or RF fields. Thus, an ion computer could do this very well. It's a small size little ion device. And now it's just some optical interface that I developed separately. And I can plug these devices in. It turns out that to deal with imperfections in the system, I'm going to need three extra spins. So not just the memory and not just the optical qubit, but three more for a total of five. This, by the way, saturates the bounds set by Wolfgang Dürer and Hans Briegel in their sort of pioneering paper on this idea. One reason I need extra spins is to do robust measurement. Let's say, for example, that even though I've got good collection efficiency with photons, I still lose my qubit sometimes, or I uh, mistrack the information, or I get photons of the wrong type, and thus I may have some errors in my measurement of order 5%. That's actually consistent, by the way, with current experiment. What I can do in this case is a very simple bit verification procedure, however, because I'm only trying to get a classical bit of information out. So I take my memory here, or one of my other two qubits, which I'll use in a moment, and now I do a control knot between that and the optical qubit. Then I measure the optical qubit and repeat many times. And the point is, in the, if I take a majority vote of 2m plus 1 measurements, I get an exponential suppression of measurement error at the cost of a linear enhancement of local error rates. And the overall time is just linear in this m, which means it's logarithmic in my, in my error suppression part. I should mention, I don't know if Dave Weinland got a chance to talk about the, this in his talk, but they've done this in the experiment and have been able to take the measurement error from about 90% uh, success rate to about 99.9% .9 success rate. So this procedure works quite well in practice as well as in theory. But the other thing I need to do is to improve upon the entanglement generation. In particular, because of this photon loss, because of my interferometric stability problems, I suspect that getting fidelities above 99.99% .99 is going to be extremely hard. Instead, we're going to assume that our fidelities is actually on the only on the order of 90%. So we're making entanglement. There are, in fact, entangled pairs, but they're not high fidelity entangled pairs. And what we can do is just this purification procedure, as I was outlining before, which we will need two extra spins for. That gives us the total of three. One spin will be used for so-called bit error verification or bit error purification, and the second will be used for phase error purification. At the end of the day, we get some large time overhead in this procedure, and we're going to need a very good quantum memory because of this large time overhead. These numbers are for NV centers. The numbers actually are also quite similar for doing this with ions. If my local operation time 
is, say, one microsecond. That means that my new clock cycle is one millisecond. And that tells you already that my quantum memory had better be longer than about 10 seconds for me to be able to do this efficiently. However, the nice news is that in ions, at least, 10 second quantum memories have been already reported. This, by the way, is a graph of the infidelity I get from initial 90% fidelity pair as a function of the number of purification steps that I attempt. This is not the number of successful steps. This is just the number of attempts. The point is, for example, here, I had about seven successful steps occurring in a row. There's also some improvements that you can do. You can dramatically reduce these time overheads and the sort of error rates associated if you have better collection efficiency with optical cavities. This leads to the so-called Purcell effect, which really helps in your collection of the photons and also will help improve the fidelity of the system. You can also think, what is if I want to take this system and map it to a sort of theorist-level error model, what do I do? Well, actually, it turns out all you have to do is basically multiply the local operation error rate by about a factor of 20. You can re reduce this to about a factor of 8 if you have Purcell enhancement of the cavities. So that means that your threshold now has been made worse by an order of magnitude, but your control problem has become tractable. And it really suggests that we can think of now some type of scale of architecture just using these few qubit commodity level systems. And again, my favorite ones are these NV centers and linear Paul traps. And now, rather than thinking about having to add more qubits, I just have to think about how to use photons for quantum communication. And in the NV center case, this may be less obvious to you, the idea is that I have an electron system which I use for doing the optical bits, and then I have nearby carbon 13s or other nuclear spins which provide the memory qubits in the system. So I'll just finish here with an, a brief outlook. What I've been talking about is some type of commodity good almost, some type of cheap, ubiquitous, and interchangeable device which can be used efficiently for quantum communication and also quantum computation. This makes the control problem finite size per register, and then you can really use these quantum control techniques to make efficient and good pulses. You're also allowed to have this optical interconnect system to be quite folly, to be quite faulty. In fact, as long as the error is less, less than 50%, you're okay. And if it's less than 10%, you can really just get away with only five qubits per node. You're allowed relatively high photon loss rates as well. There's a variety of implementation choices. I only talked about two. The point is you need a few coupled controllable qubits with a very good quantum memory and a good optical interface. Then there's the open questions about better code choices using, for example, these high-Q cavities that Thad was talking about for better entanglement generation, or possibly changing the style entirely and going more for cluster state rather than circuit-based computation. I'd just like to mention the collaborators in this particular project, particularly Long Jia, who is at Harvard, who's a graduate student who's helped and done a lot of the groundwork on these pieces. Uh, and also Naveen Kinesia at Harvard, who was really responsible for getting us into dynamic programming in the first place. Uh, that's all. Thank you very much. Jim. Uh, one thing I, I may have missed, in order to, to make use of these tangling pairs you're generating, do you need to do a QND measurement to know, to know when, when the photon arrived? No, you actually are destroying the photons. Yeah, so you detect, click, the photons occurred. That's not QND. So, um, the optical qubits are atoms or ions. The optical qubits are not the photons. They're, They're not the photons. No, no, no. That would be no good. I agree. John. There's two statements about it. In practice, for ion traps with the numbers I, just, I was just telling you about, that means 10 second quantum memory times. No, what I require. That's right. In practice, what it really is, is I need my local error rates are going to be 10 times worse effectively because of this. But my time is going to be 100 to 1,000 times worse. So if before I had a threshold of 10 to minus 4, just as an example, I hate to use that number, but okay. Before I had a threshold of 10 to minus 4, now I have a threshold for local errors of 10 to minus 5, and then memory errors of 10 to minus 6 or 10 to minus 7. So for the quantum communication, you actually need memory time for as long as it takes. Actually, 
I'm just going to go back a few slides. In the quantum communication side, when I, so the question is the following, what type of memory do I need to do quantum communication? Let me just go back. So the point is, when I show you this graph, this is the average generation time. But the actual memory time you need is about a factor of 10 smaller. Because most of this time, you actually are just completely failed. It's only the final successful run of the repeater that generates the pair. That, that final run takes between 1 and 10 seconds for this particular protocol in the optimized regime. So there's still about 10 seconds, actually, for this distance. Now, if you want to go, however, intercontinental distances, so if I want to talk from banks from the East Coast to the West Coast, or from the US to Europe, then the generation times are much longer than the memory times that we know about. And this becomes a real problem.